In the Islamic belief system, the Black Stone of Mecca holds great significance as a revered object among Muslims. But there exists an obscure reality linked to the Kaaba. According to the teachings of Jesus Christ, a cautionary message is confined within the Kaaba. Let's find out exactly what's going on here and trust me, you'll not want to miss the shocking new evidence presented at the end of this video. Recently, an astonishing event occurred in the sacred land for Muslims. It was an unusual snowstorm. Yes, I'm referring to the Kaaba in Mecca. The unprecedented snowfall in Kaaba, the first of its kind, has attracted the attention of hundreds of thousands of religious individuals who believe it is a divine message. Could it be a sign that God is trying to communicate with us? This is where it starts to get really interesting. According to the Holy Bible, snow is associated with the forgiveness of sins. It is evident in the Bible that snow symbolizes purity, grace and renewal, serving as a reminder of God's provision, protection, judgment, power, majesty, creation, care and guidance. Did you know that it embodies the transformative power of God's love, signifying the opportunity for a fresh start? Additionally, it underscores God's sovereignty over the natural world, showcasing the majesty and power of creation as a testament to God's wonders. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 tells us, Come now, and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Then in Psalm 51 verse 7, it has been revealed, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Why would God shower snow in Mecca at such a time? Could it mean that God wants to purify the place of its sins? Well, this is where things take a turn. False prophets warned against by God have historically caused harm to nations, and according to Peter, false prophets and teachers have arisen and will continue to spread harmful messages. This takes us to the Kaaba, particularly the black stone known as the cornerstone, drawing a comparison to Satan's imitation of Christ. Jesus, who knows everything, reveals that Allah in the Quran is confined within the black stone of the Kaaba, and Muhammad is identified as a false prophet. Together, they are the Antichrist. The Bible teaches us a very important thing about the Antichrist, and you may want to pay close attention to this. 1 John chapter 4 verse 3 says, And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist which you heard was coming, and now is in the world already. In Romans 10 verse 9, confessing Jesus as Lord is identified as a public declaration of becoming a Christian. False teachers who do not meet this criterion receive strong condemnation from John, being labelled with the term Antichrist. It's essential to note that this spirit differs from the world ruler mentioned in the end time scenarios. John clarifies that the spirit of Antichrist is an existing force and mindset in the world of his readers. The spirit of Antichrist manifests as a form of false teaching that advocates a counterfeit godliness, detached from the biblical representation of Jesus as said in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 5. John had previously addressed the concept of Antichrist in 1 John chapter 2 verse 18 and 1 John chapter 2 verse 22. In 2 John chapter 1 verse 7, he further warns, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Those who deny the humanity of Jesus are deemed adversaries of Christ or antichrist. But let's take a pause for a moment because things are about to get really shocking. And you might want to listen closely because this will be important for the new evidence revealed in just a moment. Did you know that Abraham and his son Ishmael were responsible for constructing the Kaaba according to Islamic tradition? Muhammad, after being forced out of Mecca to Yathrib, now Medina, and later returning, transformed the shrine into the central point for Muslim worship and pilgrimage. Originally, the pre-Islamic Kaaba housed the black stone and statues of pagan gods, but Muhammad is said to have cleansed it of idols upon his triumphant return to Mecca restoring it to the monotheism of Ibrahim. Muslims believe that Ishmael, Abraham's first son, received the blessing of the Kaaba, leading his descendants to undertake an annual pilgrimage and sacrifice feast at the Kaaba, as mentioned in the New Testament. Although Abraham is recognized in the Bible as a man of faith and obedience to God, Muslims view him as a prophet and ancestor, specifically through his son Ishmael. 
It's important to note that, contrary to the Islamic belief, Isaac, not Ishmael, is considered God's chosen son in the Bible. Ishmael is described as a warrior, not the one inheriting his father's legacy. Now, did you know that the Bible presents Hagar as a handmaiden of Sarah, Abraham's wife, while Islam regards Hagar as Abraham's second wife, with Ishmael's birth seen as in accordance with God's will? Moving on to the concept of Antichrist and false gods, the Antichrist, also known as the Man of Sin, is anticipated to appear before Christ's return, performing miracles with Satan's help to deceive people. And this is where things start to take a dark turn. This figure is expected to cause corruption and oppression globally. False gods and individuals who claim to speak on behalf of God but have personal agendas like Muhammad. According to Jesus, false gods are dangerous and he warned his disciples to be vigilant against them. The Antichrist or false god is predicted to deceive many with false miracles and teachings, initially claiming to be Jesus and later declaring himself as God. Despite these supposed miracles, the Antichrist will not be able to fix his own bodily deformities. God will grant him the ability to perform miracles as a test for humans, including raising the dead and displaying earthly riches. False gods, Jesus warned, can lead people astray with their deceptive signs and teachings. Recognizing these charlatans is crucial, as they claim to speak on behalf of God but have their own agendas. While Jesus showed compassion to those seeking guidance, he responded with righteous fury and bold conviction when dealing with religious hypocrites and false teachers. But here's where it gets really important. In the book of Revelation, John has a scary vision of a dragon and two beasts. The first beast comes from the sea and gets power from the dragon, who is Satan. This beast is really scary. It has ten horns, seven heads, with ten crowns on its horns and blasphemous names on each head. The beast looks like a leopard, but has feet like a bear and a mouth like a lion. Daniel's vision of a beast is similar to John's in many ways. It's helpful to study both Daniel and Revelation together. In Revelation, the word beast refers to two things. Sometimes it means the empire of the end times. The seven heads and ten horns show that the beast will be a group of nations rising to power to control the world under Satan's influence. This could be all the Muslim countries combined together. Later in Revelation, the beast refers to an individual, the man who leads the empire. The beast will be wounded and then healed according to Revelation 13 verse 3. He will have power over the whole world and demand to be worshipped. He will fight against God's people and have power over them for a while. But the beast's time is short. According to Revelation chapter 13 verse 5 and Daniel chapter 7 verse 25, he will only have complete control for 42 months or three and a half years. We believe that the beast in Revelation is the Antichrist, the one who will oppose God and try to be like God, even setting himself up in God's temple and claiming to be God. He is also called the man of lawlessness and the man doomed to destruction. In Daniel's vision, the Antichrist is the little horn that comes from the head of the terrifying beast. When the Lord comes back to judge, he will defeat the beast and destroy his empire. The beast will be thrown alive into the lake of fire. We don't know who the person will be that becomes the beast of Revelation, but it points all the fingers to Kaaba. But here's where things get terrifying and you may want to pay close attention now because it's all about to be revealed. According to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 7, this person will be only revealed when God removes the Holy Spirit's influence from the earth. It's interesting to compare the different biblical visions of the world's kingdoms. In Daniel 2, King Nebuchadnezzar dreams of the kingdoms of the world as a big statue, an enormous dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. Later, the prophet Daniel sees a vision of the same kingdoms, but he sees them as scary beasts. In John's vision of the final worldly kingdom, the empire is shown as a scary and misshapen beast. These passages give two very different views of the kingdoms that people built. People see their creations as big monuments and works of art made of valuable metals. But God's view is that these kingdoms are unnatural monsters, and the beast of Revelation will be the worst of them all. In John chapter 5 verse 43, Jesus stated that he came in his father's name, but the people do not receive him. He warned them that if another comes in his own name, that people would accept him. 
This points to a future scenario where a deceptive figure, influenced by Satan, would gain significant power and authority. But that's not the end of it. We found some more very important passages that are about to change everything. Revelation chapter 13 verse 2 describes how Satan grants this individual power, a throne, and great authority. During Jesus' temptation, Satan offered him all the world's kingdoms in exchange for worship, but Jesus rejected the offer, emphasizing worship only for the Lord. As part of the end time events, Jesus, not privy to this timing, will receive it from the Father. Preparing for Christ's return involves drawing closer to the Lord through prayer, reading, scriptures for guidance, and living a holy life that pleases Him. Let's stay close to the Lord and ensure readiness for His return.